Welcome to Breathe California TV. I'm Terry Trumbull, a volunteer. We're in our 30th year of doing this show to help you better understand um, health issues affecting your lungs. Breathe California, um, even with the epidemic, was able to help uh, uh, 50,000 people with breathing. Normal year, it's about 150,000 where we help people with breathing difficulties. So today we're talking with Councilman Raul Perales, who's got an awful lot to help us with on breathing issues like transit, which gets people out of their cars or smoking. So he'll be on in 30 seconds. Stay tuned. It's, it's given me a chance to get out and be with people who has the same problem. And uh, it's, it helps you to, uh, to manage your life better too because you hear different things from each person and uh, it's just been really helpful in many ways. Welcome back. I'm Terry Trumbull. This is Breathe California TV. If you want to help Breathe California out, just call us at 408-998-5865. Our guest today is uh, Councilman Raul Perales, who represents downtown San Jose and has been in the press quite a bit recently for things we'll discuss about in a little bit. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you for having me. So um, we've got a lot to um, talk about. Um, air quality issues that are very important with things that you've been doing as a council member, as a member of the Valley Transportation Authority, better known as VTA. Um, work that's coming up on trees, which are amazingly good for air quality. And uh, you've got a couple of smoking issues that are coming up before council. So you want to start off talking about uh, VTA, you've had some disheartening events there, but overall tell us um, what's happening and then get to whatever is being done to get transit more available to everybody. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, VTA uh, and really our, our city of San Jose uh, had a, a tragedy strike with the shooting that happened there at the rail yard. Um, and, and for me personally, as uh, you're aware, and, and I think a lot of our community, I unfortunately had uh, a longtime friend um, that was one of the, the nine victims. And, and so it's been difficult for, for uh, my family and I, uh, but also as the council representative that represents the area where this uh, incident happened, also being a BTA board member, uh, certainly a lot uh, has, has weighed on, on me, um, but also there's an obligation that I have as uh, as a leader uh, in the agency and with the city of San Jose to ensure that we're responding adequately and uh, and specifically, as you point out as well, being able to get uh, our our VTA light rail line uh, back up in full operation, something that we were you know already really in in the middle of after uh, a, a year plus in a pandemic uh, with limited service of both bus and light rail, we were really just getting to that point on, on being able to, to get back to full capacity and then this tragedy struck. And so it has been a challenging time for VTA as an agency, uh, but we also know we have a lot of riders out there that uh, you know depend on these services um, and, and something that my, my friend um, was, was really proud. He was an overhead linesman uh, working on the the power lines that, that run uh, light rail, uh, servicing them, maintaining them. And, uh, and it's a very specialty task. And actually that's been one of the, the reasons there were uh, actually uh, a lot of really specialty skilled areas on running light rail um, that uh, these, these nine individuals did. And so that's been one of the biggest challenges for ETA is to, to work with personnel, determining how we're, we're gonna be able to move forward, whether it's um, you know training staff that is on hand uh, or getting uh, temporary staff to come in and fill those positions before we could safely reopen light rail. And I will say we have some, a bit of good news that uh, there is 
an expectation to try to get light rail back up uh, and operational by the end of this month. And, uh, and certainly again, a, a lot going into that in regards to, to with personnel, uh, staff, um, we're gonna need to utilize that maintenance yard, the light rail maintenance uh, facility there. Um, unfortunately, it's very, very unique type of facility. We may be able to relocate some office uh, personnel, but there's a facility there that we'll have to get back into use. Um, so as you can imagine, a, a lot of, uh, you know, human needs that really go into to getting back into operation. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's, that's been a major challenge, but we're excited about, about being able to get back to full service. Uh, I've been on the VTA board for uh, six and a half years, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to, to serve our community uh, with their, their transit needs and to be able to continue to uh, prioritize getting people out of single occupancy vehicles, which I know is, is something that's a huge goal for Breathe California, right? To, to be able to get people out of those single occupancy vehicles, because we know it is the single uh, biggest polluter in uh, our, not just the city of San Jose, right? But, but really throughout our country. And so if we can get more people to utilize transit, mass transit, public transit, uh, we know that we can we can lower those greenhouse gas emissions uh, and really create a, a healthy environment for all of us. And so I've, I've um, been happy to lead on the VTA for the last six and a half years. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been the chair of the Deer Don Station Joint Policy uh, Advisory Committee, helping to uh, ensure that high-speed rail is, is going to continue its uh, pursuit of coming into downtown, helping with BART Phase 2, which is going to be San Jose's first subway uh, coming, it's, it's you know, uh, underway now uh, in the, the early stages of that uh, to be able to, to continue from North San Jose. Uh, so we're excited about these opportunities. I'm personally excited about the growth of transit uh, in the area and happy to be a leader on VTA. So the six and a half years you mentioned sounds like your entire term on the council. Um, that is correct, yeah. Uh, I, I have had the privilege of serving on the VTA board my entire term on the council. So uh, I think I told you this uh, earlier, but I was very impressed with your uh, presentation that KCBS ran at the uh, memorial for the people that were shot and as an inspiration to VTA employees. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think certainly having such a close tie to, to one of those nine individuals that was, uh, that was lost in that tragedy, I understood the, uh, the real personal implications on family, friends, and, and coworkers. And, uh, and just recognizing as well how much my friend, um, you know, he really, really enjoyed his job. And I know so many VTA uh, employees, they feel that it is a family and they really uh, cherish the responsibility that they have um, in, in the roles that they play in, uh, in VTA. And so um, just was important for me to, to deliver that message uh, as well. Well, I think it's a credit to you and the rest of the board, as well as the leadership that you've hired to have that kind of a work environment. I think all of us who've been working appreciate that kind of a situation. So, um, how has the epidemic uh, affected VTA's ridership? I mean, mass transit always has a problem getting enough money off of fares to pay for itself. And uh, as you know, Breathe California is very fond of telecommuting and getting workers so they don't have to drive to and from their workplace every day. But I just wonder how it's affected VTA. Oh, it's been tremendously detrimental to VTA and not just VTA, but uh, really this was nationwide with, uh, you know, public transit, mass transit, and uh, two reasons. Number one, uh, a lot of people, as we know, right, were, were working from home. Um, people were, were scared, right, uh, nervous about getting into confined areas. But the other and more, more really more confining were the rules uh, and regulations on distancing, social distancing, and uh, really a limitation on how many um, passengers we could get into an actual bus or a train train car and uh, we were unfortunately seeing uh, a lot of pass ups where where we would pass up right passengers that were waiting at a bus stop for instance and uh, the bus was already at full capacity again per COVID guidelines and uh, we were seeing so many pass ups over the last several months 
that was one of the, the really, really, um, I think, big uh, heartaches for the agency and for, you know, our, our um, you know, our, our bus drivers, right, and, and BTA employees, uh, not wanting to, to, to do that, but being forced to because of where we were at within the pandemic. So uh, fortunately, right, those limitations have all decreased after June 15th. Uh, and like I said, the timing um, was, was really when we would have liked to begin to to increase our service, but unfortunately, due to, to that tragedy uh, in May, it, it, it really has hindered us to, to get back up to full service. So I think at the end of the month and, and definitely by August, we'll start to see uh, an opportunity of back uh, at, at full capacity on both, both uh, bus and light rail and, um, and, you know, and, and be able to, to get riders back, uh, back on the trains and the buses. Well, um, I've seen newspaper articles that seem to say a large portion of people that have been working via Zoom or out of their homes aren't terribly eager to go back. And um, in terms of our air quality, as you noted, uh, in the Bay Area, 85% of our unhealthy air that we breathe here derives from personal cars. Mm -hmm. um, so um, not terribly eager, even though I know it would help VTA to, get them back, but anybody that does want to go back to a workplace, we're hoping they're using the transit. Um, yeah, so agreed. I mean, we, we've also seen the, um, you know, the, I guess the benefits of less cars on the road, not only health wise, um, but commute time and traffic. I think a lot of people have experienced, you know, the, the, the diminished traffic in the Bay Area and recognize that as a real positive uh, thing and um, you know, and, and in order to keep it that way, we can't just simply go back and revert to you know commuting to work and single you know occupancy vehicles. And uh, one way, as we know, out of that is to be able to take uh, public transit or mass transit. And so we're going to continue to to encourage people to do that. Again, that's why we're making these billion dollar investments like uh, BART into South Bay uh, because we want people to utilize those alternative modes of transportation to get to and from work. Uh, and around the bay. So talk a little bit about staging on BART. You mentioned it's going underground. Um, it's already open to Berryessa at this point. Um, I'm just guessing the next point is the uh, Portuguese Catholic Church at um, Santa Clara in 101, roughly. Yeah, so actually uh, the phase two um, is the continuance of the 16 miles. So we did 10 miles already and the North San Jose will have six miles left. But this six miles is going to be very, very difficult because we're boring underground uh, after we, uh, you know, leave the, the Barrios of Art uh, North San Jose station. Uh, it's going to start to go underground and there will be the first underground station, as you point out, there behind the Portuguese church. And, and then uh, that tunnel will, will make a turn and go under Santa Clara Street, go through Deardon, or have a stop in downtown, then a stop at Deardon Station, and then ultimately uh, coming back up above ground and having its final stop there by Santa Clara University. And so uh, that six miles is going to take a lot of, lot of time because it's all underground. Uh, we're uh, underway of, um, of, you know, the beginning of, of that on note, you know, as far as identifying all the areas, noticing to uh, property owners, we're still under those processes right now in areas that we may need to, to acquire um, for some of the above ground work or where we may need to do some of the digging. And so uh, that's where we're at in the process. Uh, we're still, you know, a good 10 years away, but from, from that, and it won't actually be, uh, it won't be done piecemeal. So we won't see the, uh, the station near 26th Street or the Portuguese Church, we won't see that open first and then move along. We're actually gonna wait till we complete the entire phase two. And when that happens, then that segment will open, much like what we saw with North San Jose, that 10 mile segment, it was had to be completed and then we opened the whole thing. So uh, we're gonna take a break for 30 seconds, but we'll be back with Raul to um, discuss what's happening with high-speed rail and um, lung issues like COVID-19 and smoking. So stay with us, we'll be back in 30 seconds. My name is Renee Montez. I've been using the CPAP machine, I would guess uh, 10 years. I, I got so accustomed to it, I don't uh, go anywhere without it. I take it with me everywhere. From the moment I put it on, um, I thought it was the greatest thing because the breathing was a lot easier 
and uh, after using it for a couple nights, I felt a, a lot of energy. Green California is fabulous. <laughs> Welcome back to Breathe California TV. Breathe California is a lung health organization throughout California. We were um, created in uh, 2006 um, from six existing um, organizations throughout the state. And we're happy each week to have a star like Raul come join us. So um, you mentioned earlier in the show high-speed rail, I understood that it didn't make funding in the governor's budget. Um, again, this is just reading an article in the paper, but where do you see us being on that? Yeah, you know, high-speed rail, um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've been fortunate, I've been the chair of the Deer Don Station Joint Powers Authority, which actually has been the local authority here that has convened uh, conversations with high-speed rail and all the stakeholders. Um, from our state senator's office to VTA in the city of San Jose, um, right, to be able to have those conversations, Caltrain, uh, certainly, right, a big component there. Uh, we're talking about a station that when high-speed rail comes in and, and we get uh, BART in the electrification of light rail that's happening now, uh, it's going to be the, the, the largest multimodal uh, train station transit center west of the Mississippi. So a, a really, really great opportunity for us here, but high-speed rail is a huge component of that. And, uh, you know, high-speed rail has never had uh, its full funding to complete the entirety of the project from the Central Valley North or at the Central Valley South. And, um, and, and you know, I think the, the, the leaders of that, the proponents of it knew that, that this was gonna be something that we were gonna need to continue to identify funding as it moved along. So I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's such a huge surprise that we're not seeing identified specific funding um, from one year to the next. Uh, that, that has been a reoccurring theme and, um, and certainly something that, that I am a proponent of. I know we have enough uh, local uh, authorities and, and elected officials uh, and including the governor's office as well that are supportive of high-speed rail want to see this be completed uh, from the Central Valley North and the Central Valley South. And so uh, we're helping to you know, do our part here, which is identify uh, the alignment of it, where it's coming into San Jose, right? Where it's gonna come into Deer Don Station, how it's leaving uh, a, lot of, right, a lot of complexities around that, but we've made some, some major strides in identifying uh, big decisions, big milestone decisions over the last several years that has not been easy, uh, but that's you know just where we're at, where we're doing our part to ensure that high-speed rail can ultimately come into the city of San Jose. So my impression when I first heard about Biden's infrastructure proposal is it did include funding for high-speed rail. As far as you know, is that still um, being considered in Washington? Yeah, as far as I know, uh, there that and a lot of other considerations, right? As we know that um, it's not a done deal yet, unfortunately. Um, but you know, there's a, a lot of really good, I think, uh, components in his infrastructure bill and things that we uh, we weren't seeing funded previously with a lot of the inner city rail, um, you know, over the last administration. And so I think it's very positive, um, and I'm hopeful. But uh, you know, we, we don't know until that's that's fully uh, passed the House, the Senate, and, and, and signed. And so I think, you know, we've, uh, we're all hopeful at the moment. So my impression is the council's got a couple of um, proposals to cut back on the impact of secondhand smoke on people, which um, I've been astounded to see how bad it is in the health studies. Can you talk about those a little? Yeah, happy to. And, and as you uh, may recall, one of the, the first actions I took in office uh, was to be able to restrict the uh, coupons that were the one dollar or buy one get one free um, coupons for uh, packs of cigarettes that were being distributed in the downtown core and um, you know soliciting for for new smokers right and and I was able to to help ban that um, in the core of downtown so I've had a good history of, of working to ensure that the uh, the big cigarette industry um, right is 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 not taking advantage of our community here in San Jose, and so we have two things coming forward as you point out. Uh, number one is the flavored uh, cigarettes ban or flavored tobacco ban, um, and that coming forward is is actually um, we're looking at that coming forward in September of this year, and uh, we will be banning uh, well 
hopefully, uh, if they count with the council support, I believe the council will support this uh, based on the conversations we've had thus far, but banning flavored tobacco products here locally, uh, which would include all the e-flavors, menthol, uh, menthol cigarettes as well. This is something that was kicked around at the state, which you may recall, but uh, was not passed. It's, I believe it's likely to be passed um, you know, in the near future at the state, but at the moment it, it is on hold. And so local jurisdictions can take up these issues ourselves. And that's what we're doing here in, in the city of San Jose. The other issue is uh, looking at uh, a multi-family smoking uh, ordinance, one that would, would help us to ensure that in uh, multi-family housing, we're looking at three units or more. So triplexes and higher, um, that we can ban smoking within those complexes. And the reason why, uh, obviously, as, as you're aware, and a lot of your, your um, you know, your, your listeners and your watchers, is because of uh, the, the the implications of secondhand smoke. And when you're in a multi multi-family building, especially ones where you're stacked on top of each other, uh, you have a ventilation system that's tied into one another. Certainly, that the smoke can make its way through windows and up through door, you know, under doors and back in through new doors. And so uh, that's the the unfortunate reality that we face in multi-family housing. And you get a lot of individuals that don't smoke, but unfortunately their neighbors may smoke. And now they're, they and their family, their children are subject to secondhand smoke. And so we'd like to ban that here in multifamily housing. Uh, and that'll be something that we'll take up in the future as well, that we're currently working on um, and, and soliciting input from, uh, from the community today. So um, we're very happy about it. I think we've got a full-time staff person in Breathe California working to oppose flavored cigarettes. They are predominantly ori oriented towards young kids to get them nicking hooked and then they'll just keep cigarettes after that because of the addiction. So um, we wish you good luck with both of those. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, trees, um, the cover of National Geographic this month has a fold out and it looks at five areas in the city of New York and the ones with the most trees and the most pleasant looking environment, the least air pollution, lower temperatures in the summer mm -hmm. are all the ones with the most trees and uh, the ones with none are uh, in the poorest areas. Um, where do you see the city going with um, getting more trees started. Yeah, well, uh, you know, fortunately, I, I actually, I'm on the Transportation and Environment Committee, and through that committee, we have a plan coming forward, which uh, we're calling our San Jose Community Forest Management Plan, and uh, it's it's looking at our, our our local community forests here within the city of San Jose, um, and people kind of scratch their heads a little bit. Well, this is the city, um, right? Shouldn't we have our forests or our trees out? Um, in in the parks and, and in the outlying areas. But the reality is, as, as you know, uh, the answer is no. We need to have trees because we know uh, what uh, importance they serve for us on being able to uh, convert uh, right our, our the into the oxygen that we breathe right uh, and be able to, to create a, a canopy. As you point out, one of the things that we see in areas that are under-resourced with trees is higher temperatures. Uh, and so that tree canopy uh, is extremely important for that purpose. Uh, and so we are underway uh, now of, of being able to look at uh, where our, our best tree canopies are, where we are um, underserved, what communities are underserved, um, and then being able to, to, to map out a better plan um, to, to be able to, to see how we can more equitably serve our entire city and all of our communities with um, better, a better tree canopy uh, throughout. And uh, I think this is an issue that, that is easily overlooked um, because it's not something that's at top of mind with land use and development and, and the big ticket issues um, that, you know, that, that a lot of people are concerned about in their neighborhoods. Uh, but it is something that really, really can make a huge difference um, in, an, in one neighborhood to the next right, in, in regards to, to what their tree canopy looks like and ultimately what effects that has on their lives and their livelihoods, their health. Uh, and so uh, something that I'm excited about having come back to our committee and, and being able to move forward for our community members here in the city of San Jose. Well, that would be great. Um, 
I wrote a letter to the council about a month about this. Um, I retired last year after 23 years of teaching in San Jose State and the two blocks from my parking spot to campus had holes every uh, 10 yards or so, um, all of which obviously had a tree planted at some time. Mm -hmm. um, but the big problem with planting trees is they've got to be maintained and kept up. Either neighbor or property owners got to do that. So I wish you well successfully getting that system going. Thank you. Um, so flea market is a particular um, uh, something I'm very fond of, having been their general counsel for two years, and it sounds like you have been part of pulling off a great mediation that keeps the different shops there happy and still gets a better result for the city. Yeah, I was very happy to be able to help uh, lead on uh, that. Uh, it's, you know, being born and raised here in the city of San Jose, the flea market has been a part of my life as well. And uh, it was important that we're able to, to work together with the vendors uh, and the property owners there to create, um, you know, a, a, a productive process as we move forward. And so I'm excited about uh, those, that effort ahead. So I apologize if I'm rushing a little, but uh, we just got a signal from our director to get moving. So you got about 20 seconds or so to summarize anything you want us to remember about our chat. Yeah, just uh, thank you to uh, those that, that are watching and uh, just a reminder, right, that we, we not think about what implications are there in regards to our personal health and specifically the air that we breathe, something that we, I think, too regularly take for granted. Um, but in my position, uh, I don't take that for granted. And I do recognize all the important decisions that we make, whether it be in transportation needs, uh, or all the way to, you know, what trees are getting planted or how they're getting maintained throughout our city, uh, how that has an implication on our own personal health. And so um, that's not lost on me and, and I'll continue to, to, to do so as uh, your elected uh, leader here in the city of San Jose. So thank you for all you've done and uh, we greatly appreciate the leadership you've shown and uh, we hope our audience tunes in next week for another show. Thank you for joining us.